Good afternoon. My name is Susan Tribe, and I am a technical support specialist here at Teledyne Techmar. Today we will be covering a webinar on Hespia's troubleshooting made easy. We will be covering both the 7000 and HT3 Headspace auto samplers. The 7000 is the older Headspace model that Techmar manufactured, and the HT3 is the more recent product replacement for the 7000. Some topics that we are going to cover on the 7000 include determining, setting, and checking flow rates and pressures. We will go over how to leak check the unit, do a little bit of troubleshooting of motor, sensor, and heater errors, look at some causes for mechanical obstructions, go over clearing the memory, talk briefly about reproducibility and sensitivity problems, as well as some items to cover when doing preventative maintenance on your unit. We will then transition over to the HT3 and look at the same topics, however, how they relate to the HT3 and its new product design. We will also encompass some software diagnostics and sample history logs that are built into the software design. Finally, we will look at both instruments and topics that relate to both of them, looking at setting our GC runtime correctly, setting our schedules and methods to be optimized, checking out our GC, some method optimization mode, reproducibility and response issues related to loop fill, sample matrix effects, and the IQ, OQ, PQ options available for both instruments. First, we are going to talk about setting standby flow rate in the 7000. We would like to measure our standby flow at the top of the needle. We set this gas flow rate when it's in the ready or standby mode. Typically, the standby flow rate is set 1,000 divided by the GC cycle time. The correct standby flow rate helps with carryover between samples. If you look at the flow path on your screen, you will note that no gas comes out the vent during standby. We will look at this a little more further when we go through troubleshooting. But it's important to remember we want to measure the gas flow rate coming out of the needle. Another important feature of method parameters for 7000 is what the static file pressure is. To determine the static file pressure, you are going to prepare your sample just as you normally would. You are then going to make sure all your method parameters are set correctly for the application. On the 7000 itself, you are going to turn the vial needle flow controller all the way off, which happens to be turned clockwise. You are going to allow the sample to run, but do not hit step. When the vial goes up on the needle, you are going to record the pressure on the vial pressurization gauge. This is your static vial pressure. Once you have the static vial pressure, you're going to want to set the vial pressurization. This vial pressurization is generally set 2 to 4 PSI above our static vial pressure. Again, from the standby ready screen, we're going to press 3 on the keypad and now open the vial needle flow controller all the way, which is clockwise. You're going to press the page down key until you get to the pressurized setting. Turning the pressurized valve on, you can then dial in the vial pressurization that you would like with the control knob. Another feature that the 7000 has is called a viper. The viper is a variable injection pressure regulator. It is typically placed on the outlet vent on the rear of the unit. It is typically set at 2 to 3 PSI below the vial pressure. This creates constant back pressure in the system during loop fill for increased reproducibility. 
You will want to press 3 on the keypad of the 7000 when you're in the standby ready mode and press 3 for vent check. You will, you will place an empty vial on the carousel. Once the vial is up on the needle, you will adjust the pressure knob on the front gauge of the Viper. And again, the Viper is typically plumbed into the vent outlet of the rear of your 7000. And you will notice it's just some tubing that goes to a, a box that has a pressurized gauge and knob on it. When we leak check the 7000, we are going to place an empty capped vial into the carousel. And again, press 3 on the keypad and press 1 for leak check. There are on-screen instructions that tell you what to check. We are also going to place a cap nut on the vent bulkhead on the rear of the unit. Does the pressurized gauge read the vial reach the vial pressurization setting? If not, the most common place for check checking for leaks in the 7000 is going to be in the valve oven area around the six port valve, the fittings, the needles, and around the pressurized and vent valve. If the pressure gauge does reach the vial pressurization setting, that usually indicates that we have a very poor seal with the acceptor on the vial. Maybe the cap is not crimped correctly. So you may want to repeat the process with another new crimped vial. You may also need to check the incoming gas supply as there may be some leaks in those lines. Another thing that you can do is disconnect the transfer line to the GC and plug the end and check for leaks. Again, the most common place for leaks are at the sample needle and sample loop. I do want to remind people to be careful about cranking or over-tightening the fittings. When these fittings are hot and over-tightened, it is very likely that they could break, so it's important if you do need to tighten a fitting that you allow the temperature to cool down to room temperature before tightening, tightening the fittings and then allowing the instrument to heat back up. What you should see on your screen now are some of the 7,000 gas flows. Again, during the standby flow, our gas comes in, sweeps our sample loop, and comes out our sample needle. You can also see that the carrier line comes in through the six port valve and lifts right back out over to our GC. During both the standby and vial pressurization modes, there should be no gas flow coming out of the vent. The only difference between these two modes is when the vial goes up onto the needle to be pressurized. From vial pressurization mode, we go to loop flow mode. As you will see, there is some gas flow out the vent during loop flow mode. It is actually a burst of flow out the vent, and then there should be no gas flow. The vent valve opens briefly to allow the sample loop to backfill with gas, and then closes to trap the sample in the sample loop. So if you were to, were to measure gas flow out the vent during loop fill, you should see a burst of flow, and then the flow should immediately decay down to zero. If you still have gas flow out the vent during the loop fill mode, it could be an indication that your vent valve is not sealing. After loop fill, we go to inject. During inject mode, the six port valve rotates, and the carrier gas from the GC back flushes the sample loop with gas and transfers your sample over to the GC. While that is happening, our pressurization gas both flushes out the sample needle and gas goes out the vent at the same time. So if your standby flow rate was 100 mils a minute, it is very typical for you to measure approximately 50 mils out the vent because it is split both to the gas flow to the needle and coming out the vent. After inject mode, the instrument goes back to the standby mode to continually flush the sample loop between each sample. 
It may be hard to see, but I hope some of you can see the question marks, which I'm going to try to point out, at the bottom of the display on the 7,000. These question marks indicate that the carousel is not installed or there is possibly a problem with the encoder emitter board for the carousel. You will also note that there is a star after the PLAT 1L7S. This star is not necessary to be there for proper function of the instrument. Just no question marks. The star actually indicates that it is centered in the position that it needs to be. Something should also be highlighted for each one of the columns shown for sample, vial, index, and mixer. Again, there will be nothing highlighted for the indexer if you do not have a carousel installed. Pressing 2 on the keypad takes you to a motor test screen where each motor can be tested individually for mechanical issues or sensors. Another thing you can do is to release the platen motor by pulling it towards you about an inch to manually rotate the platen. This is located underneath the front panel display if you remove the front panel of the instrument. The platen motor is a silver motor that hangs down in front of you. And it does pull towards you about an inch. With this platen motor disengaged, you can reach in and grab these heterothermal couple wires, which are orange and yellow, to help you rotate the platen motor to get the question marks at the bottom of the sensor screen to disappear. It's important to note that the platen turns 359 degrees. It will stop and hit a mechanical stop, and then you will need to rotate it back the opposite direction. When looking at cleaning off the sensors or flags for each motor assembly, we recommend that you use a can of air or a Kim wipe with methanol. Each one of these worm gear motor mechanisms should be lubricated. We do not want you to use something like WD-40 as the spray can actually block the sensor and cause a residue that can cause some motor sensor errors down the road. Moving on to some 7,000 heater or thermal couple errors. When you power on and off the 7,000, a self-test on the heaters takes place. Each heated zone must increase 2 degrees Celsius to pass. If one of the heaters fails, it will error out, giving you an error message. It is important to remember if your unit is running at a higher temperature, such as 150 degrees or higher, You'll want to turn the unit off and allow it to cool down before turning it back on. Otherwise, the unit will not pass since the temperature is already at or near their set point and not be able to increase the 2 degrees C needed. On the left-hand side of the unit, there is an 8-amp fuse on the power supply. This 8-amp fuse is for all the heated zones. So if you notice that none of your heaters are heating up, you might want to check this 8-amp fuse. Also on the power supply is some LEDs, and all of these LEDs have a feature. LED A is an apple. is the one designated for all the heated zones. Also on the left-hand side, you will notice several electronic boards. The logic board has some LEDs on it as well, and they are labeled A through F and correspond to each heated zone inside the 7000. You can refer to the manual to determine which LED is for which heater. If the LED light is on, then I would recommend you check the resistance and ohms of each heater if the heater is not heating. If the LED lights are not on, it could be a logic problem or it could be a problem with that main fuse that I talked about earlier. Another good trick to look at is accessing all the temperatures for the heated zones in the 7000. Many of you that have the instrument are aware that the platen heater is four individual heaters averaged together to give you a temperature. 
By pressing the temperatures on the keypad and then the decimal, this will allow you to display each individual temperature of those four platen heaters. This will help you isolate the problem if one platen heater zone is going bad. It is typical at lower temperatures that three of the heaters can compensate for the malfunction of one heater to maintain the temperature. Clearing memory in the 7000. To clear out any logic issues or if something doesn't seem quite right, clearing the memory in the 7000 might help. It is important when you do this to write down all the method parameters first. After we clear the memory, the method parameters that you put in there will be gone and only factory default methods will be restored. To clear the memory, you're going to turn off the power, remove the right side panel, and locate the lever for the ROM chip behind the keypad. I have this displayed on the screen and it appears blue in color. It is possible on some older instruments that this is not a blue lever, but a metal lever. You're basically going to remove the ROM chip from the display and power the unit onto the 7000 with the chip out. It is completely normal when you power the unit on with this chip out that the screen of the instrument flash and the instrument to beep. After you turn it on for about 20 to 30 seconds, you're going to want to turn it off and put the ROM chip back in. Powering the unit back on will restore all the default methods and you will need to re-enter your own method parameters. Many problems for reproducibility and sensitivity on the 7000 can be resolved by checking the flow rate, pressures, and for checking the system for leaks. Sometimes it can be a problem with a heated zone, so it's important to make sure we go through the self-test as well as checking our standby flow rate, our static vial pressure, and our vial pressurization. Another thing that can cause problems with reproducibility is to make sure there's not a blockage in the needle or the sample loop. Sometimes the butyl rubber septa, because it is softer, can cause blockages in the sample needle. If you need to, you can use something like methanol to flush the needle out or sonicate it. Another thing is to look at is the, is your method optimized for temperature settings and equilibration time? We will look at both reproducibility and sensitivity a little later on in this webinar. A few things to look at when you're looking at preventative maintenance for your 7,000. Again, check your gas flows, check for leaks. It is also important to make sure that we clean off the cooling fans in the instrument as well as the electronic cores. Dust can cause a fan to malfunction and not cool the instrument correctly. Dust on the boards can block some of the optical sensors. We also want to lubricate our motors I mentioned this a little bit earlier. We do not want to use WD-40. Um, we recommend a Teflon-based lubricant such as 3-in-1 oil or TriFlow. You may also want to clean out your platen chambers and remove the carousel and make sure all those positions are nice and clean. I would also recommend turning the unit off and on and have it go through that temperature self-test and check those temperatures to make sure all of our platen heaters are heating consistently. You can use the FET method for running a tech standard. And I want to remind our customers out there that have service contracts on Techmar products that Techmar does offer one annual preventative maintenance call with all of our maintenance contracts. So if you need to set one of those up, you can just give us a call to have us come out and take care of this for you. I'm now going to move on to the HD3 which is our replacement for the 7000. The HD3 comes both as a static, loop-only system or a dynamic option, which comes with a trap. While the static unit is very similar to the 7000, the technology is slightly different in how it measures the gas flows and pressures. 
The HT3 has a mass flow controller instead of a pressure regulator in gauges like on the 7000. This gives us much better control of flow and pressure in the unit. The incoming gas pressure to the HT3 must be a minimum of 65 psi for the mass flow controller to function correctly. It also should not exceed 100 psi. Typically, if you're using the same gas tank for your GC and your HT3, we would set it, the tank pressure at 80 psi. Standby flow is very easily set in the method of the HT3. It can be changed depending on the HT3 and GC method run. So if you have multiple methods that you're going to run based on the operating conditions, you can change the standby flow rate in the method. You don't have to worry about measuring the gas flow with the needle, measuring gauges like you do on the 7000. All you need to do is locate the parameter in the method and change it. You will want to save it as well. Again, we want this standby flow rate to be 1,000 divided by our GC cycle time to make sure we have the sample loop flush between each sample to prevent carryover. Checking the static file pressure on the HT3 is easy as well. It is checked automatically when the file is run. You are going to place your sample vial in the carousel and start your sample run. As soon as the vial is pushed up onto the needle, the software will measure the static vial pressure and display it in the unit status pane. It also records this value in the sample history. This makes it much easier to measure the static vial pressure if you have different matrices for your samples from sample to sample. You can also adjust your vial pressurization setting more easily by not having to change knobs and dials while you run. Typically, a static vial pressure of zero during a run indicates that a vial was not crimped correctly. So the sample history log in an HT3 software is very vital to help you monitor your samples. The vial pressurization method parameter is typically set between 8 and 10 psi. The default vial pressurization in the software is 10 psi. It's important to remember we cannot set a vial pressure lower than the static vial pressure. The HT3 software has both a pressurized set point and a pressurized time. The way the software works is it either reaches the vial pressure first or the vial pressurization time. An example of this is setting the vial pressurization to 10 psi for 0.2 minutes. There's no way that the system can get to 10 psi in this short amount of time. So once the sample reaches 0.2 minutes, it's going to move on regardless whether it's reached 10 psi or not. So it's important for you to make sure that the time is set long enough to get to the pressure that you would like. You can also monitor this pressure in the sample history to see if your time setting is long enough. This time factor is limiting as a safety feature so that we are not over continually pressurizing the vial and not reaching the pressurized setting. Another thing to remember is we don't want to overpressurize the vial. 2 to 4 psi above the static vial pressure is plenty. If we overpressurize it and put more gas into the vial than needed, this can actually dilute our sample with the pressurization gas and cause a lower response. There is no Viper accessory on the HT3. The Viper is actually built into the unit. The HT3 is plumbed with restrictive tubing on the outlet vent to act as a Viper. During the loop fill mode, there is an algorithm 
hard-coded into the software to slow down the gas flow to fill the sample loop more consistently. This is approximately 1 PSI per 10 seconds. Again, we want to make sure that our loop fill pressure is generally set 3 to 5 PSI below the vial pressurization, and it is set up the same way. We want to make sure that the pressurized time is, is adequate to reach the pressure that we want. Sample loop size can bear on our results as well. The loop sizes that are available for different applications are from 100 microliters to 5 milliliters and can be easily changed out for your application needs. Lead checking the HC3 is very easy using the TechLink software. The lead check parameters cannot be changed. They are all hard-coded into the software. It is also re important to remember that these lead check parameters are set up and designed for 22 mil vials, while the HT3 can run 9 or 12 mil vials. It's important that you lead check the system with a 22 mil vial. When you put a new empty cap vial in the HT3 and run through the leak check, the unit will pressurize the vial to 15 psi and then wait for 30 seconds for a pressure drop. If the unit passes leak check, you're good to go. If it fails leak check, you can also perform the benchmark test, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. It's important to note, too, because we have a dynamic option of the HC3, you can leak check for both loop and trap modes. If the loop fails, then it's most likely that the trap will fail as well. The unit does not repressurize the system to 15 PSI after running a loop leak check. If one or the other leak check fails, you can also test each system independently. Do a loop-only leak check and do a trap-only leak check. Some common places for leak failures for leak check failures are at the needle, trap, and valve. On your screen now, you should see the HT3 leak check for a loop-only system. Gas flow comes in, pressurizes the vial in the system to 15 PSI, and then holds. Common places for leaks with a loop-only system are at the vent bulkhead if the vent valve is leaking, at the needle, or the quick disconnect, which are located between the mass flow controller and the pressurized valve. The next diagram you should see is the HT3 leak flow path for a trap or dynamic system. As you can see, there are three additional valves in this system, the bypass, the trap, and the sweep valve. It still does the same thing by pressurizing the system to test the leak, the loop leak check pathway. It then Cycle some valves around to test the additional valves that are in the dynamic pathway. Some common places to look for leaks when you have a dynamic module are at the needle again, the quick disconnect, but also the bypass valve where the GC is. The common thing we see is if the GC head pressure is dropping, that there is a leak at this bypass valve. The HT3 comes with its own software. There is no keypad to run the HT3 like the 7000. While there was software available for the 7000, not many customers used it. Some of the features that the HT3 software has to diagnose problems are in under tools and diagnostics. The Motors tab allows you to move each motor assembly individually inside the HT3. It'll tell you its current position, and you can move it to another position. It also has a Home All Motors button, 
which will safely move each motor assembly in the instrument back to its home position if you don't know what that is. There is also a valve tab. This tab allows you to toggle each valve on and off individually. Each valve and instrument has a point uh, LED light, which you can see come on right at the valve, as well as an LED light on the DC output board. The advanced tab shows the sensor positions, flatten positions, and if for some reason you get some vials stuck in the instrument, that is where you want to find unload flatten if there are vials stuck in the instrument. There is a package tab. This package tab shows the communication going on between the boards inside the instrument as well as between the HC3 and the computer running it. While this may not be seem very useful, it's very useful for troubleshooting and service to indicate a communication problem between the boards in the instrument or if the computer is having problems communicating with the instrument. There's also a firmware tab. This tab allows you to flash upgrade the CPU board with programming to the latest version. So if we determine there's a problem or an enhancement, there are firmware files that can be downloaded to upgrade your system. Another feature that the HT3 software has is 21 CFR Part 11 compatibility. This is selected when the software is loaded. This gives you independent control of functionality per user, and basically you have a user manager or administrator, and you can set up individual users for the software and give permissions for each user for access to different parts of the software. It also keeps a record of each user and what they have done in the instrument. The software functions exactly like the regular version with a few minor exceptions. The hold button is disabled as well as the step button, and these are due to 21 CFR Part 11 compliance requirements. One of the last tabs under Tools and Diagnostics in the HT3 software is the benchmark test. The benchmark test is a really great diagnostic tool. It is an electromechanical test that the instrument runs to check all the motor assemblies, check all the gas flows, check GC communication, check the heaters. However, it can provide some misleading results. Typically, if one test will fail in a particular section, such as valves, all subsequent tests after that may fail as well, but there may not be an issue. So it could be a little bit misleading. The results of this benchmark test can be printed out after you run it and are recorded in the system history. The system history will give you detailed information of the failure. So if you're running the automatic valve test and it says it fails and you go into the system history, the system history will specifically tell you that the automatic valve test failed that the pressurized valve NO port failed to maintain pressure with a delta of 1.3 PFI. So this is excellent troubleshooting information. A copy of the entire benchmark test is also stored in the data folder of the HT3 test link on your hard drive. Another common problem with the benchmark test is if your GC pressure is not set up correctly. You need to make sure, if you're running both loop and trap modes, that the GC pressure should be greater than 25 PSI across the transfer line. If this pressure is not set up correctly, typically we see the bypass valve failing. And this would only be if you have the dynamic option. On the screen, you will see a, a sample of the history log. This software log is very useful. You can see when you open it up a date range to search for. You can search by a particular error. You can also search by a particular user if you're using the 21 CFR Part 11 compliant features. 
it records everything for each sample. So if you look on the screen here, it'll show you that a vial was injected, what schedule you ran, what the static vial pressure was for that vial, what the loop pressure was, what the vial pressurization was. So this is very useful information if something isn't right for a particular sample. If you're running 10 samples and sample 6 just doesn't look right on your GC run, you can pull up the sample history and say, oh, the static vial pressure was zero. Maybe it wasn't crimped correctly. The other thing to know that after each scheduled run, a unique data file is created. And this only happens when a, a schedule is completed. This is stored in the data folder as well on the hard drive directory of the TechLink software. This provides detailed information on each scheduled run, including all the information that you see in the system history, and all your method parameters, what firmware versions were run, and any other additional information for that method that is in the that is also located in the method. Clearing the memory on the AT3 is pretty easy. If you open the front door of the AT3, and straight ahead, the large board in the center is our CPU motor board. This is where the battery is stored. So if your instrument's doing a little strange things, giving some strange errors, a common thing to do would be clear out the memory. We're going to turn off the unit, open the panel up, and you can see the watch size battery on the CPU board. You either want to remove the battery or put something between that battery and the clip to to break the connection. And now all you have to do is, after it's broken, turn the unit back on. Again, the method parameters will be wiped out, but since the instrument is PC controlled, all you will need to do is re-download your method from the TechLink software. The battery is a 3 volt 2032 battery. This is a very common battery size that's sold at many drugstores. And this battery holds all our methods and configurations of the unit. Looking at some maintenance issues with the HG3, if you have the dynamic option, a common thing that you're going to be doing is changing the analytical trap. I want to throw out there that there is no gas flow running through the trap when the unit is in standby. This is very atypical compared to our purge and trap instruments that have analytical traps that when we're sitting in standby mode, there is gas purging through the trap at all times. This is not the case on the HT3. We're actually flushing the sample loop on the HT3. So it's recommended that before you run anything, if you're going to run a trap sample, that you bake out the trap after the unit has sat idle or overnight before running anything. The other thing I want to bring to your attention is the fixed nut. Each trap that goes in this instrument has a fixed nut and ferrule. And the fixed fitting goes on the end with the green peak tubing, which is down here at this end of the trap. Um, you want to use caution as this green line may snap if you don't hold it correctly to unscrew it. And leak check will still pass if this fitting is loose or snapped. So you could replace your trap. We recommend that you run a leak check afterwards. And it might pass leak check. You might run your first sample. And you may not have good results. And one of those reasons could be because of this line being snapped or loose. So I just want to bring that to your attention. Another thing we discussed was the sample needle possibly being clogged with septa or being blocked. Uh, again, when we check the flows, we want to make sure that we cool the instrument down and, uh, before we remove any of the fittings so we don't snap them. To remove the H23 needle, I put this on here to kind of help everybody out. You want to make sure if you're going to remove it, to remove the lines at the top and the side, and then remove these three hex nuts. 
This will allow you to take the needle out of the unit before you disassemble it. The picture to the right here shows after it has been removed, you can remove the three Allen screws to disassemble the needle from the spring and the housing. If you were to loosen the Allen screws first, then the spring and these other parts would fall down inside the unit. This is a picture of the vial loader assembly. Again, we will want to lubricate the motor assemblies inside the instruments. We want to use, again, a three-in-one oil or tri-flow. Basically, put a little bit on that worm gear. Use the diagnostics in the software to run the motor up and down. And there is additional information in the user manual on lubricating these motor assemblies and the frequency that they should be lubricated. If you're having some gas flow problems, you definitely will want to verify the gas flow at the mass flow controller. Definitely make sure that we have an incoming gas pressure of 65 psi. We can go under tools and then diagnostics and go to the valve tab in the software. On this tab, we can set the flow rate and verify that it's reading that in the software. You could also disconnect the outlet of the flow meter, which is I'm pointing it out here on the screen. Where the green line comes out, you could verify the gas flow there to make sure it is reading the same thing that you have it set at. Also, can check it at the needle in standby, make sure it's all reading the same. Another thing that we will want to look at is the pressure of the mass flow controller in the unit status pane. When we're sitting in standby, we really should not have a pressure greater than 4 to 5 psi. If so, this could indicate a blockage or restriction in the gas tubing pathway, the sample loop, or the sample needle. Another common issue that I have seen is when the carousel indexes between positions 30 and 31. Sometimes we get an index error or a vial gets stuck. This is when it transitions from the outer ring to the inside ring. Sometimes we just need to pull up a little bit on that vial loader foot, which I show in the picture, to help that clear and move back and forth a little more smoothly. If you ran a benchmark test and determined that maybe a valve is malfunctioning or failing and you need to replace it, you will want to remove the top rear cover and loosen Loosen the rear cover to get to the valve area. This picture is a picture of a unit with a trapping module. There are four valves there. The trap valve is uh, located inside the front panel of the unit. On the newer units, they have a thumb screw in the center that can be loosened to access all the valves. On the older instruments, there are some little set screws in each corner that will need to be removed. And then you will need to remove the fittings at each valve. One nice thing about the HG3 is all of the valves in the instrument are the same. So it's probably a good idea to have one on hand as a spare just in case you need one. It is also recommended that you run a leak check after replacing one of the valves. If a vial should break inside the instrument, it's very easy to get the vial out of the platen. You will have to open the instrument up and remove the insulation. There is also a worm gear at the bottom that you can turn to manually turn the platen to get to the other positions not exposed. And there is additional information in the user manual on pages 107 and 108 how to do this. Some issues with the heaters inside the HG3. Um, the HG3 uses RTDs and not thermal couples. And an RTD is a resistive thermal device that measures the temperature via resistance of the heater. So for those of you that are familiar with thermal couples, that's just basically a probe that's measuring the temperature of something. The RTD is actually looking for resistance in the heater to take its temperature. If a particular heater is not heating, you probably want to check the fuse. There's one for each heated zone. 
There is also a main fuse on the AC board. So that would be a good indication if none of the heaters are heating that the main fuse is not working correctly. And the main fuse is located right here. And these little red cap fuses are the fuses for each individual heated zone. The RTDs are located on the left side of the board. And there is also an LED light for each heated zone representing the logic signal. There is also an LED on the temp board for each individual heated zone. So the CPU sends the signal from the temp board then to the AC board. Again, if the fuse is okay, we've got a light, we're going to want to both check the resistance of the heater and the RTD to make sure that that's functioning correctly. Some common things to check during the preventative maintenance of the AC grade is pretty much gone through everything by turning the unit on and off from waiting for the heated zones to cool, blow all the dust out from the unit, clean off the fans, make sure all the optical sensors are clean. We're going to lubricate the motor gears, inspect the sample needle for damage, allow it to go through self-test, check our flows, run a lead check and a benchmark test, and then run your checkout standards. Now moving on to a couple of things that are common between both the 7000 and the HD3. Definitely would like to make sure that the GC variable time is set correctly to maximize our sample throughput. We define the GC cycle time as ready to ready on the GC. So we want to make sure that if you have a 16-minute GC run time, that we give it a couple extra minutes to get back to the ready state for the next sample. Also, optimize your schedule based on varying method parameters. If you're running multiple methods, you want to make sure you run the methods with cool temperature zones first because it may take a while for them to cool down, especially the platen, which could extend your sample run time. Looking at some reproducibility and response issues, we definitely want to make sure that our GC is functioning correctly. We want to do a direct inject on our GC to make sure we're getting the response that we want. If that works correctly, we want to perform a full evaporative technique. Here, we're going to take 10 microliters of our standard and inject it into an empty vial, allow it to run so that we fully vaporize the sample into the head space. Then we're going to run our GC. Doing this several times will help us optimize our method. Typically, we see the response for the FET very similar to a direct injection. Another thing we can do is use the method optimization mode to make sure that our temperature and our times are set correctly. This will help you get a better idea of what parameters need to be adjusted. The HT3 software actually has an MOM tutorial that you can use to help you optimize these method parameters. It also can be done overnight and added on to a sequence so that you can down, your downtime can be minimized. Again, you want to make sure that your loop fill time is correct. If your loop fill time is too short, we will not fill the sample loop correctly and can cause inconsistent loop fills and poor response. Also, if it's too long, you may have low flow when the loop fill, when the loop is back flushing over to the GC. And again, the shorter the loop fill time, the higher the compound response. Another couple things to look at are sample matrix effects. Um, we want to look at the partition coefficient for the sample matrix. Compounds with lower partition coefficient values transfer from the matrix into the headspace very easily. So these are going to give us a much better response. Compounds with a higher K value are more likely to stay in the matrix instead of becoming in the gaseous state and going into the head space. So they're going to be more difficult to get a response with. One of the things that you can do to overcome this 
is adding salt to force polar compounds like methanol into out of the liquid and into the gaseous phase for better recovery. I want to caution some people on this uh, to wipe off the outside of their vials if they do add salt, because once that is the vial is in the platen, sometimes the salt can come off and corrode the electronic boards inside the instrument and get into the motor assemblies and cause some mechanical issues. Another thing that we can do is adjust the pH to give better recovery as well. Uh, decreasing the sample size will also allow the compounds to get into the gaseous phase better. So if you have a solid material, you may want to break that solid material into several smaller pieces. Or if you have an aqueous sample, uh, mixing usually helps transfer some of the compounds into the headspace easier. The other thing you'll want to look at is the boiling point of the solvent. And if, depending on what that is, you may need to lengthen the sample equilibration time or increase the temperature to help get the analytes into the headspace better. One of the other things that Teledyne can do is provide IQ, OQ, PQ for you, the Installation Operational Performance Qualification. We do have this available for both the 7000 and the HT3. This can be done at time of installation or at a later time on an annual basis, or if you receive another instrument from another lab, we can do that at that time. You just need to contact us to get that scheduled and set up. And why, for those of you out there that have a 7000 and are looking at HP3, um, might want to know why, why should I upgrade? Um, both of them utilize the static headspace technology. However, the HP3 has a dynamic capability to increase the sensitivity. The HP3 slightly has a, has a slightly larger carousel with 60 positions. And one of the other things is the platen heater inside the HP3 is a coiled heater and has only one RTD to read the temperature. As you remember when we talked about the 7,000, there are four individual heaters and four separate thermal couples, meaning four times potentially the parts to break down. Um, RTDs are more stable and accurate in the reading, and just with one heater uh, gives us more consistency in temperature. Another thing that we talked about is the mass flow controller. Uh, we use this mass flow controller in several of our Techmar products. This allows us to control the pressures and flows very accurately and completely in the software. Again, we talked about not needing the Viper on the HT3 to control the loop fill. And the leak check is much more intuitive when we have a mass flow controller. Uh, 7000 has some software that we talked about. Uh, most people use the remote keypad instead of the software. HT3 comes with the software and it can be run on the same PC as your GC software. There are some minimum operating systems required so that it functions correctly. And hopefully you have seen with some of the photos in this presentation that the HT3 has panels and parts that are easily removed to allow full access to the instrument for maintenance. Another thing to consider is if you buy a static HT3 and then decide down the road, maybe I wanted that dynamic capability, that can be done down the road at a later date. You would just need to give us a call to get that set up. And it should be a pretty easy transition between a 7000 to an HT3. There are a few differences in technology, such as the mass flow controller. So some of your method parameters, while they're transferred over, they may need to be optimized for a smooth transition. This brings us to the end of our webinar today. I hope you enjoyed it, and thank you for participating. Uh, please join us for our next webinar in this troubleshooting series. It will be based on UV per sulfate, QC troubleshooting made easy, and it will be held on Tuesday, October the 4th at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. And you can go to the Techmar website right now and get registered for that. And if you have questions later on, feel free to call technical support. The number, both domestically and internationally, are on the screen. 
or send us an email. We'd be happy to help you out. Thanks again.